everybody. All right. We good? Testing, testing. There we go. Um, currently a student at University of Pennsylvania working in Roland Dunbrack's lab at Fox Hayes Cancer Center. Um, we focus on structural bioinformatics, and I'm going to talk to you about some work uh, classifying CDRs and developing a new uh, structural CDR database for antibodies. Um, so, so again, this work is focusing on uh, classifying CDRs. Um, we have done this work, uh, uh, a postdoc in Roland's lab did this work previously um, using, uh, at the time, an internal di uh, dihedral clustering metric as well as um, uh, an affinity propagation um, algorithm. And really, the, the goal here is to um, de determine the, the families of conformations of CDRs for all of the CDR lengths. So CDR 1, 2, and 3 on both the heavy and light chain, and they go through a diverse uh, 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 amino acid links. Um, and, and so we want to kind of extract what are the families of um, conformations of CDR links in antibodies. Um, just a brief nomenclature for how we're going to kind of label what, it, um, what are the different conformations of, uh, uh, that come out of the clustering. So this is just a typical Ramachandra map with uh, uh, well-inhabited regions labeled. And we use kind of an approximation uh, part partition of the um, uh, of the Ramachandra map where um, we, we, we call this ABLE notation, so the alpha region, the beta region, the, uh, the uh, left-handed region, and the extended or epsilon region. Um, and so when you see some examples from the talk, um, there will be strings of, uh, of these, and, and these are basically labeling the, uh, the uh, unique conformations of the antibody CDRs. And so um, a little bit for the application that we're most interested in. Um, so we um, also have, uh, do work with collaborators uh, working on antibody design. So the idea between how we do antibody design is uh, CDR graph design. So for example, this is an example of a, a, a PDB2J88, which is an antigen of uh, B. venium uh, hyaluronidase. And um, this is the native binding antibody. And for particularly for L1, this is a L1-11-1, one particular unique com uh, con confirmation of L1-11. Um, one thing you might want to do is design in a longer CDR, in this case um, L1-17-1, to make contact with the antigen itself. And one thing that we note in our CDR confirmations is that they typically have unique profiles. So um, you get information about what kind of amino acid mutations are actually feasible and realistic to make given the profile of a family that you graphed in. So this is why we want to develop these clusters so that we can leverage that towards design. Um, so how do we classify CDRs and what has changed from um, one to the next, um, from, from the last work to, to the next? So uh, given uh, three example structures, we want to classify these and uh, make them into families. So the first step in clustering is uh, defining a metric. And so our metric is, um, a, is a uh, angular statistical method, uh, uh, metric which geometrically represents um, the length of the um, chord between two angles on the unit circle, actually that length squared. Um, and we calculate this for each corresponding uh, pair of residues and then store that in an array. And then there's a couple ways that you can combine the final uh, information. Previously, we combined using uh, the sum of these scores. Um, but that works as more of kind of an approximation and can really skip over details at any singular residue, which I'll talk about later. So we've actually chosen to take the max of these uh, calculations. So, um, so that will help us to determine if these structures are even different at even one single residue. And so this is an example um, of different families overlaid and how they might look in RMSD space versus Ramachandran space. Um, again, here I have the confirmations for um, L1111 and L1112, which are existing clusters, as are L1113. And, you, and I just have highlighted where they're different in Ramachandran space. So L1111 and L1112 kind of look similar in RMSD space, and that's a metric that's um, also traditionally used in this kind of work, um, whereas this is different at multiple residues um, and looks really different in RMSD space. But I do want to get the point across that while these look similar in RMSD space, they're different in Ramachandra space, and we call them different clusters. Um, so one thing that changed from the uh, previous work to the next is uh, we replaced the affinity propagation algorithm with a dbscan clustering algorithm. You may be familiar with dbscan. 
the goal is to, um, out of a two-dimensional uh, data space um, formed from your metric calculation, is to find regions of contiguous density that are separated by regions of minimal density. And so kind of the result of DB scan clustering will um, take these different uh, uh, regions of contiguous density, regardless of their shape, and they can even have different densities, um, and uh, partition it into uh, families. So this is just a representation where um, clusters are things that are called core points, where you have a search distance epsilon, um, and you have a, a, another parameter, minimum points, which is the number of points that you need in order to form a cluster. And taken together, if you find minimum points with an epsilon, then you're a core point. If you're with an epsilon of a core point, but you're not yourself a core point, you're a border point, and then everything else gets labeled as noise, and that helps for us because we can include all of the data from the PDB without B factor and resolution cutoffs, and dbscan clustering kind of naturally extracts some missolved structures and other things and collects them into outliers as well. And so, um, but we really needed something a little bit more because, um, uh, again, I defined epsilon and min points. Um, this is an example for kinases that a postdoc in our lab uh, worked on where um, if you're familiar with the, uh, the uh, DFG motif, this is considering a, uh, uh, the D and the F and the residue beforehand. Um, and each column here is a different cluster, and each row is a different residue. And so if you run dbscan clustering at um, epsilon point 10 and min points 20, you get these uh, four nice clusters that come out of the clustering. But if you just make a minuscule change of um, 0 0.05 at, uh, epsilon and min points of 20, then um, uh, two of the previous clusters get merged, but you get these two new clusters that are clearly interesting, even though they have a different density. And so what we wanted to do naturally was find um, some kind of method, and we looked at optics for dbscan, which is another uh, dbscan modification. We looked at hierarchical, and they just didn't quite work for our purposes. Um, we want to combine information from a run of a, a grid of min points and epsilon. And so the, the first step in this is like run the entire grid and you'll get clusters for every, every run of dbscan at uh, epsilon and min points uh, parameter set. And the first thing we do is we actually get rid of any clusters that meet this criterion, which is any, a, any member within the cluster, um, any two members, if they're more than 150 degrees apart, we actually get rid of that cluster altogether. And that, um, that's because in the metric that we use, um, any residue moving from one Rama bin from the AL or uh, uh, from, from the ABLE notation, if they're more than 150 degrees apart, they're different in Ramachandran confirmation. But then we need a way to connect all this information. So, um, so we treat each cluster that comes out again, and now they've survived this cluster filtering process. We, we treat them as nodes on a graph. And we connect the uh, graph with edges that are the Simpson similarity score. So the Simpson similarity score is a metric that simply asks the question, is, is, is one of these um, nodes a subset of another node? And here, C represents the actual cluster membership. So if a cluster comes out um, multiple times at different parameters, then we just take the, the uh, union of that cluster to, to give us the final cluster. And so an example of the end result is that the merged cluster goes away, but we still get to keep the interesting clusters that were there before. And so now I want to talk about this in the context of what's changed from the last clustering to the next. So the clustering um, nomenclature for um, uh, the uh, previous work for the north clusters is shown above. Um, so for an example for L111, um, which is one of the more well-behaved uh, CDRs, um, we had three different clusters in the north clustering, um, two kappa and, and uh, one lambda cluster. If you look pretty closely, there was some structural variation in the lambda cluster, which may have been somewhat of a red flag. And this is the, um, this is the um, uh, sequence logo for L111.3. Um, now, in the newbie DB scan clusters, we get six um, L111 clusters, but I'm going to focus on the two lambda clusters. So if you um, look closely, um, one of the lambda clusters that come out is, um, is a part of the original north clustering. But there's a new one that splits from, from the old north clustering. And these are clearly different by a peptide flip at the uh, third residue. 
And the other nice property is that, again, we want to really associate the structural information to the sequence information because then when we go to and do the design problem, we want to make sure that we're picking the correct amino acids to preserve the structure. So here at this uh, six residue here, um, there was a partition between glycine and proline and a bunch of other residues. And the new clustering, that is completely partitioned out in the, uh, in the uh, sequence logo. So we think we're getting a tighter association between the structural information as well as the sequence information. Um, one phenomena that you often encounter in the PDB are what are called peptide flips. So peptide flips, you can identify these considering residue I. Um, about 150 to 180 degree uh, change in psi of residue I, um, um, accompanied by the same uh, uh, change in dihedral in uh, phi of the next residue. And so what that looks like structurally is the carbonyl is just 180 degrees flipped um, from, from uh, uh, or uh, across the peptide plane. And one way that you can identify this is this is a, just an example of electron density for one of these peptide flips. And um, anywhere where there's green, there's coordinates that, um, or anywhere there's uh, uh, red, there's coordinates that don't have uh, density associated with it. And the reverse is in green, where there are, uh, is density but no coordinates there. So um, we want a way to quantify this for all of our CDRs. And so we looked at uh, two tools that will help us do this, um, help us identify and maybe fix these possibly. Um, one is the PDB Redo data bank, um, uh, database. Uh, PDB Redo for any single PDB structure um, that has a structure factor file, which they've been required to have um, for years now, um, has an associated PDB Redo structure. And PDB Redo uses a combination of different refinement tools and some custom in house machine learning algorithms and all other kind of things to both identify red flags and PDB structures as well as try to fix them as well. So for each antibody structure that had a structure factor file, I also got a refined structure from PDB Redo, as well as um, individual atom electron density calculations from EDIA score, which is going to help me determine, OK, um, when I'm looking at the features in the cluster, are some of them maybe due to um, bad crystallography in this case? And so here are some examples. Um, we want to use this to invalidate or validate clusters that come out of our clustering. So um, again, we will get a set of clusters, and, but that doesn't tell us anything about, the only thing that says is that that is a pattern in the PDB. It doesn't tell us anything about the biophysical characterization of the clusters. So this is an example of EDIA score measured for each individual residue along CDR um, H113. And so um, this is a new cluster that came out of DB scan. But if we look at the um, average EDIA score for each residue, again, there are uh, 13 structures and they're solved at 2.6 angstrom resolution, you see this clear dip in EDIA score. And that's reflected in this uh, pi mole figure where most of the electron density in the middle is just a uh, void. So this is a cluster we would, for example, invalidate. This is one of the uh, most canonical north clusters that, again, came out in our clustering. Um, so you can tell that it's uh, uh, pretty consistent in EDIA score all across the board as well as um, a bad north cluster, one that we'll have to invalidate um, because it's different by a peptide flip at the third residue, and that's reflected in the EDIA score. So this gives us a really systematic way to um, say, OK, we have all these new clusters, but they might all, not all be physically relevant. How can we start to get at these questions? Um, so another example of that is non-proline cis clusters. So typically, um, here, I, I, I have the Ramachandran map plotted out for um, H210. And um, anything, any residue that's orange here uh, is a cis peptide bond. So again, the columns are the residues, and, and the rows are different clusters that come out. So for this particular cluster, there's a cis um, peptide bond, but there are no prolines in this profile. And typically, we see prolines associated with cis peptide bonds in antibody CDRs um, and other contexts as well. Um, but that's clearly reflected in the EDI score as well. So um, this carbonyl and um, uh, oxygen, as well as the uh, backbone nitrogen, are just completely out of density. So, so we would invalidate that cluster. Um, the other thing is that um, PDB Redo, we really want to maximize the amount of information that we have for any one cluster. And part of what um, PDB Redo can do to help is refine a structure into a cluster if we think it should be uh, part of that cluster. So, for example, um, PDB1DSF, 
Here's a sequence given for that uh, structure. And here's a sequence profile for our largest H113 uh, 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 cluster, H1131. And just looking at the sequence, you, you kind of intuitively might think that this is an H1131. Uh, these profiles are pretty, pretty unique. When we look at the PDB structure, which was assigned to noise in the DB scan algorithm, um, there's a large spot of electron density where the carbonyl should be, but the carbonyl is completely flipped outside of it. Um, so this could be a reason why it was assigned to noise. Um, in the PDB reduced structure, it's reassigned to H1131, um, and, it's, and the carbonyl is flipped back into the electron density. So this is something that um, can help us uh, also maximize the amount of information that we have for one cluster, whereas this typically would have been put into noise, now it's put into H113, and we get the sequence information and the structure associated with it in our new database. Um, so just uh, really quickly, um, this work has been going on since the 1980s when Cyrus Shothi and Arthur Lesk um, first had a, probably a, just a couple dozen structures, and we're just looking at these structures and their dihedral calculations. Um, and their definition for uh, what is a canonical conformation is very kind of like uh, perspective of like pattern emergence. It's something just commonly there. Um, but, but we wanted to pr propose a new definition where um, kind of taking into account the large amounts of data and how different the quality uh, of data that can be deposited. So we wanted to propose this new definition which takes into account um, uh, how large is a cluster compared to the entire uh, PDB set, how sequence diverse are the uh, clusters, as well as are they validated by the EDIA scores. And so just a quick summary um, for, for example, L310. Um, so this is the cluster name. This is where they came from, either our new DB scan clusters or the north clusters. And this is where we validated them or not. So, so, for example, the, the main north cluster stuck around. Um, one of the cis pe uh, peptide bond uh, L3 structures was invalidated, and out of our four new DB scan clusters, only two of them were validated, and um, two of them were invalidated. So this is a real systematic way to be able to develop this database and be confident in the, in the structures that are a part of it. Um, and the last slide is just a table that you can kind of see in the entire CDR clustering universe what what has stuck around and, and what is gone. Um, so out of our initial uh, database, um, updated means that we, uh, the north cluster stuck around, we've just updated it with new information. Initiated means it's a new unseen DB scan cluster that wasn't previously in the north clustering. And um, retired means that we actually invalidated a north cluster, so we don't want to be doing designs with uh, clusters that aren't validated. Um, with that, I'll take any questions. Um, I do want to say, you know, we're, we're still working on this, but um, uh, as soon as the publication's out, then we're going to update the uh, website that, um, that our lab maintains called PyG Classify, where you can get all of these um, classifications yourself if you're doing any antibody design work, if you're doing any antibody classification, antibody modeling work, then, um, then this would be good to look out for. Um, I'd like to thank funding sources and my lab. Uh, there's Roland, and there's me, and... Uh, with that, I'll uh, take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Hi, very nice. Thank you. I was wondering, did you look at the single domain antibodies like camelids? Uh... Yeah, yeah. So all antibodies, whether they're SCFVs, camelids, Benz Jones, are included. Um, so there weren't too many, I guess, individual features. Um, there are some uh, camelid antibodies that have very unique um, uh, C CDR1 conformations for their heavy chain. Um, but that is something that we can kind of start to look at a little bit more in depth. I've been doing a very broad view. Um, but I can say that there are some single domain um, differences from uh, 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 heavy chains that are part of FABs and SCFVs. Yep. Hey, Rich. Uh, great talk. So, Thanks. when you have your able yeah. category, do you also, do you, when you're thinking about sort of what to do next, is there a big variation in how um, the B factors for the different regions of the loops are? Like, are there some wiggly or dynamic regions? And so, do you have like A star for dynamic, or have, have you thought about the chain moving, or, or is, are these things pretty locked down? Um, so I would say in general they're pretty locked down, but if you do a structural alignment of just say one cluster, 
there, there is variation. So that's why um, the antibody database we include in Rosetta Antibody Design, for example, um, in, in Rosetta Antibody Design, you could think about just picking one median structure and just threading the sequence onto it. Um, but instead, we include the original structure because there is variation. Um, I did look at B factors as well. Um, they correlate with EDIA scores sometimes. So if uh, structures may solve, it'll have a high B factor. Um, but there are cases where something has a high B factor and it probably comes, especially in H3, it probably comes from more uh, protein motion rather than um, something being missolved and just misplaced. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. So uh, please, um, first of all, we will reconvene at 2 p.m. And the speakers in the afternoon, please come a few minutes before during the